Yes, my friends, and welcome once again to another edition of Nightmare Theater. I am, as always, your host, Baron Mondo Vondoren, here, strangely, with El Sapo de Tempesto. And we are here at the Pensacola Cultural Center for... Cultural Center, are we in the right place? Uh, I know it's the first time we've ever had any culture on this show, but uh, we're here for the Pensacola Paracon. Uh, we're going to go in and see if we can talk to some people about ghosts and Bigfoot and, you know, strange things like black Republicans, you know, things like that. Um, this building here apparently is haunted itself, the Pensacola Little Theater. There's supposed to be ghosts that go around the stage and, and do strange things and sounds just like, you know, the cast of Glee to me. But anyway, uh, why don't you guys watch this and, uh, uh, do we have a movie? I think so, I got some right Okay, well, just watch this movie and we'll be back in a little bit, hopefully with some interviews and some other things to show you here from the Pensacola Paracon on Nightmare Theater. overwrite that one. Best I could do this week. People just never die when it suits you. <laughs> do they, Doctor? Oh, beg your pardon, uh, Baron. You don't have to count it. It's all there. Always is, always is. 
See you next week. Lynch, yeah. I may need you sooner than next week. Something very special this time. Oh, I like that. Very special. Yeah. Has a ring of money to it, eh? I want a corpse dead no longer than six hours. Two hundred. No, five hundred. Three hundred. Doug, let's say I'm a patron of science. But I can't promise. Results, not promises. Uh. I don't understand your trusting him so much. Money, Charles, is a miracle drug for people like Lynch. Such a grotesque dream. Or perhaps, perhaps he shall be a nightmare. Would it matter? Not to me, not if I can give him life. That's worth anything, anything. Including your own life? Even that. To succeed in creating life is the ultimate achievement. To hesitate, to fear, to doubt now would Everything I've ever done was pointless, empty. This is, this is my life. But to create life, should man leave that to God? Here on earth, man is God. <laughs> Go to bed, child. Tanya will arrive in the morning. You'll want to look your best. Good night. I thought I would at least deserve a hello. I'm sorry, Tanya. I'm very happy to see you. Your father and I were always happy to see you. Uh, here, let me help you. Please. Thank you. How lovely you look. <laughs> Thomas! Thomas, come here. Uh, Thomas? <laughs> would you please take Mademoiselle's luggage? Take the luggage inside. Luggage? Inside, eh? Mm -hmm. Tanya. Mm -hmm. uh, your father is still dressing. He worked rather late last night. As usual. Is he still experimenting with animal transplants? Well, you know how he is. He's been at it for 20 years. He'll be at it for another 20, but uh, tell me about the university. Well, except for my studies, it was rather boring. But I didn't go there to socialize. Aren't you pleased? I'm like my father, stubborn. When I want something, I get it. And I did. First of my class, I'm now a licensed surgeon. Congratulations, oh. doctor. Father! Father! Oh, so Bye, nice to see girl. you. little <laughs> girl. <laughs> Is that the way for a licensed surgeon to behave? This one does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Jack and Morgan. Poor. They're going to hang him good. Snap his neck for sure. What about it, Simon? You and Harry with me? Of course. Jack Morgan? Nope, never did like him, though. Neither did you, right? I'm waiting, yes or no. Yeah, I'm with you, Tom. And Harry? Where I go, he goes. 
<laughs> Toast to Jack Morgan. Long may he die. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you have heard this story many times before. <laughs> it doesn't matter, Father. It's a charming story. You know, Father, the name Frankenstein still echoes through the halls of the university. I'm not surprised, but I stopped caring about those fools when I left them with their hands clapped over their ears 30 years ago. Uh, please sit down, Charles. Your leg must be tired. No, it's fine. Thank you. Was it difficult? I mean, very difficult seeing my daughter. Sometimes. Mostly it was my being a woman. The professors have a lot of old-fashioned ideas about a woman's place. I'm sure you will make a fine surgeon. Thank you, Charles. But I do not want to be merely a fine surgeon. What do you want? To assist you, Father, in your work. You know, since I was a youngster, I was always interested in your experiments. Each summer when I was here, I... I would sneak into your laboratory. But it was always locked. I know. But I discovered the other way. The one through the wall. The bedroom wall. Huh. Well, you little devil. I was always curious. Went to land. I'm curious to see how far you have progressed. And to show you my own progress. I shall be delighted to discuss it with you, of course, as doctor to doctor. But I must warn you that my ideas are quite radical. Even more so than yours, Father. Really? Of course. I am my father's daughter. You are referring to an animal transplant? Human. Another hundred. This order is very delicate. There are certain people to be paid in advance. What people? <laughs> well, Baron, you know, I can't tell you. Professional ethics. Don't speak to me of ethics. If you want what you want, it will cost you another hundred. The way I see it, Baron, you don't have any choice. I'll have to get it for you. Take your time and don't worry. I won't sit down. I wouldn't want to damage this uh, wonderful furniture. Mm. Excuse me. I was... I was looking for my father. Uh, would that be Dr. Marshall? It would not. Well, I never thought the Baron had it in him. But Dr. Marshall would. Mm. No, not on his best night. A drink, eh? Much too early. Never too early for anything. My dear sir, you are an obnoxious man, extremely vulgar. And I'm certain that whatever you are thinking is merely fantasy on your part. I would say that you spend too much time alone in your fantasies. <clears throat> Be careful. It will soften your brain far quicker than whiskey. How can somebody so lovely be such a bitch? It depends on the company I'm with. I'm sorry, Father. I'm sorry. I didn't know you had a visitor. Mr. Lynch? Yes? I will see you out. Always a pleasure to talk to a lady. Good day, lady. Father, I said I was sorry. I heard you. Oh, yes. Two hundred now. Yes. Two hundred on delivery. Yes. When will it be? Very soon. When? The hanging Jack Morgan day after tomorrow. So? So he's your man. We're here with Christopher Booth, uh, the filmmaker. Um, 
very interesting guy. Um, the only guy here at Paracon whose uh, fashion sense rivals my own. And um, <laughs> <we're>, <laughs> we want to talk about some of his films. Um, you started out making narrative films, right? That was what really, I mean, because you weren't strictly making documentaries when you began. Well, actually, I worked for Playboy for 10 years, and actually um, we did like 56 films last two years for Playboy and what was kind of cool about that is we did the real high-end production right so we actually got a lot of um, our H that's when HD first started coming in so we learned the craft of using manipulating a budget and doing everything very fast I mean you talk about two a month yeah. wow. I mean, they're very high-end films and so that but of course you know that was not what we wanted to do you right. know you can only shoot so many boobs right so the hey, thing I don't know about that well, you know, well, actually, I'm in the paranormal business now, and you know what? Boobs are like orbs. None of them are real. <laughs> but, any anyway, after that, we, we weren't really, you know, we were making good money, it was good, but that's not what we, what we really wanted. I was a rock and roller for a long time, and music business for a long time, too. But then we, we, we left Playboy made our first one. And was that Death Tunnel? No, it was called Dark Place. Oh, and Dark Place? started a chap, which you guys are horror, Matthew McGlory. Oh, yeah. The late, rest in yeah. peace. Exactly. Matthew. And uh, he had, it was the last film he ever did. Off film. And uh, he was a giant and big fish, tiny and devil's reject and all that. And that was great. A beautiful man, rest in peace. That did really good internationally. Didn't do too well in America, only because at that time the Saw giant movies came uh. in. And it was all gore and all that stuff. And that's not what we did. We did more psychological, like the old Hammer films. Yeah, the old, Vincent Price films, all that great stuff, right? right. right? Yep. And that was more psychological, and it was great, a movie called Dark Place. And then after that, somebody, uh, we so then we were like fixing up movies for Hollywood, you know, like, because we did really good, we do the editing, we, we do the production design, we do the music, we do everything. Do everything. Do everything, the graphics, everything, we just, uh, you know, we have like the David Lynch type, Ridley Scott type look, is what our idols were, so right. our films had that lighting and that color and that weirdness. And, that so they would hire us to fix films up. I met this guy who wanted to uh, fix his film up, so he did his trailer, and they were rich. So they flew us down to Kentucky. And then at that point, the guy said to me, "Do you want to make a movie?" And I go, "Yeah." Well, the location we looked at was Wave Hill Sanatorium, which is one of those places. Had you ever heard of it before that? No. Uh, had, had, you, had, had you been interested in the paranormal before that? No. Film? While we're down the scout, what happened is the guy said, well, we want to make a pirate movie. And I go, really? And then I found out the history of Wave Wilson at a time where 60,000 people died in a tunnel, 500-foot tunnel. They would wheel them out on gurneys to hide them from the living patients so the morale wouldn't go down. So they hid them through the tunnel. I said, there's your movie. Yeah. So it became Death Tunnel. And while we were scouting at the tunnel, they left me at the bottom of the tunnel. Yeah. All alone. That's when my first paranormal experience happened because I felt oppression and a sense of anxiety, and I freaked out. And I ran up that tunnel, <laughs> threw up. But while I was running up, I put the camera, video camera, behind me. Two weeks later, back in LA, I was looking at the scout footage. There was a girl standing in front of me with no eyes, and there was a screaming like somebody being murdered. Wow. In the after that, we did The Exorcist, The Haunted Boy, oh, the haunted boy Secret Dive of The Exorcist, which is the real, we're the only people in the world that filmed in the real exorcist Really? What happened? The, boy, the scariest bedroom in the world. And the furniture. What, what happened to the furniture in that room? What happened to the furniture in that room was putting coke. The priests would not touch it, so they hired a moving crew to go to the church where it was and take the furniture and lock it up in cold storage over 20 years. Really? Now it's in Air Force, Scott's Air Force Base on the on guard. <laughs> Incredible story, that is. You know, and then the diary tells you all kinds of stuff that's in our show, like the sheets. The boy would write on the sheets what the devil told him to do. The dead bishop. The diary was written by the bishop. He wanted the bishop to die of a cruel death, which he did. And he actually wrote the map of hell on the sheet. 2,000 feet. We shoot. Now you know where to go. Right. Well, I'm, I'm middle management, so I never get down that. Okay, 2,000 feet down is where he says no. 2,000 feet. 2,000 feet. And it's amongst many other fascinating things we found out and interviewed the, uh, the demonologist of the Vatican, who actually deciphered the Devil's Bible, which is another incredible, scary situation. And he gives you his 
thoughts on whether this case was actual possession or mental illness. He said it is actual case, but there were some things he wouldn't answer. Like, did the boy get his scratches? Is that true? He goes, no comment. I go, well, I like that when they say no comment. <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> well, when you, when you think about that, do you, uh, obviously in your films, you don't make a lot of judgments like a lot of people would. You leave it up to the viewer to figure out. One of the out. reasons that we were off this reality show is because we don't debunk, we don't skeptic, and we don't exploit, and we don't, and we, we just like you guys doing your thing, we would come in and film it, and it's interpretation, or, or it's up to you to decide what you think is real. We just tell you the story. Thanks for taking the time to talk to well, us. My pleasure. And, um, Definitely appreciate it. Definitely. Do um, you have a website that people can check out? www.spooktv.com. S P O O K E D TV.com. We can get anything I just talked about there. Amazon.com. We have it. We're on the Sci Fi Channel and Chiller Channel. Um, they have our titles there, but they put a lot of commercials in. Ah. And we got the greatest behind the scenes and all, like an hour extra footage on each one. Also, if you buy The Exorcist Show, you get a copy of The Real Diary. Get to be at the real diary, what really happened, and then the documentary that follows the diary. Thank, Thank you very so much. much. I gotta go dig a 2,000 foot hole. <laughs> yeah, 2,000 feet. Start digging. <laughs>
out, Baron. Good work, Lynch. Good work. <sighs> Thank you. Charles. Go on, Turner. Earn your money. Yes, sir, Baron. I really like doing business with you. It's clean and it's quiet. Was it difficult? It's difficult as drinking a bottle of whiskey. And you can see that's not very difficult. How much will I? One liter this time. I was hoping you wouldn't do this. So this is why you no longer use the animals. Human transplants. Tanya, will you please leave? But I can help you. You don't understand. I do, Father. I do. What are you going to do with the brain? Tanya, please. Not impossible, Tanya. But the heart, the brain, you have to keep them alive. Yes, we've done it before. Inside another human body? We don't need a human body. But you are going to put Morgan's heart and brain into that creature? Tanya, no more questions. But, Father... I don't want you to get involved. If anything should go wrong, the law would hold you equally responsible. And I don't want that to happen. Soon, I'll tell you everything. Please be patient. I'll try. Good luck. Is everything ready? Ready.
more seconds. I hope Mr. Morgan's brain is as cooperative. It will be, Charles. And so for the past 20 years, my experiments with animal transplants have been pointed to this week. All the abuses. I have endured my friends. All the accusations against my sanity and worse will be thrown into their sanctimonious faces. Looking for something? There's clouds. I need a storm for my final step, an electrical storm. For only lightning will give the creature life. That's why I haven't transplanted the heart and the brain. Oh, I can keep them alive indefinitely in the laboratory, but once I transplant them, they'll survive only a few hours. Unless activated by lightning. I want to see how you'll keep them alive. You shall. You will succeed, Father. I will. I promise you I will. And the medical world will be brought to its knees. I want that so much. To see you realize your dream. Something that no one will ever take away from you. They won't have to. I'll give it to them. Bad. White matter? No. Further down. In the gray matter. See? The hypothalamus is damaged. It's no good, Doctor. It must be repaired. There is time. We must make the time. You cannot use the damaged brain. To what extent is it damaged, perhaps? And if it isn't, the hypothalamus is the main center of the automatic nervous system. You may be creating something that cannot function. What good would that be? To give it life and just let it lie there, nothing more? We'll have to take it. What about anger and pleasure? Two emotions connected to the damaged part of the brain. Two vital emotions. Either one in excess could be devastating. Correct the damage first. There isn't time, Joe. Every minute cuts into the life of that heart. Twenty years, I can't throw away twenty years by minutes. <laughs> but think, Doctor. Think, no. Instinct, instinct changes the world, not thought. And my instinct tells me to transplant that brain right now. If you won't help me, I'll do it alone.
Charles, everything will be fine. Bands will be done. want him to live. Don't fail, Charles. You're right. I should have taken time to repair the brain damage. It probably wouldn't have made any difference. The effect of the damage would only show after the brain was reactivated. We'll never know. And to never know is more frustrating than failure. Take a long breath, Doctor. Then we can begin again. I'm afraid not. No use trying to make me feel better. It's too late for me, Charles. Perhaps Tanya will succeed. Will you help her? Of course. But wait and see how you feel in a month. I'll feel the same. I don't even know if I want her to attempt it. A moment ago you did. That was just self-indulgence. The whole experiment, really. Yeah. No, no, it wasn't. Who can say, Charles? Perhaps there are some things man should leave to die. Never thought I'd hear myself.
Come forward. Another step. Another step. Right now, Charles. I've got to get the police. No. Not yet. Tanya, I must. Do you want to disgrace my father? Your father's dead and you're worried about his name? You cannot keep this from the police. Not his death. Only the creature. That's impossible. What if he kills again? Its brain is damaged. I warned your father, but... Tanya, no. We must tell Harris. Yes, tell him. But tell him it was a robber. But there is Morgan's body. What did you do with the other corpses? The lie tank. Put Morgan in it. Then you can go to Harris. Please, Charles. I don't know, Tanya. What could you hope to gain? Time. Time to think of some way to save my father's reputation. Please, Charles. Didn't you love him? You know I did. So do it for him. the dangerous way station on the road to the planet. The jumping off place for the fantastic rocket ship built in outer space. Yes, you'll be out of this world through every stirring moment of conquest of space. You'll live the strange topsy-turvy life of men who live as no other men have lived before. Evacuate section 34. 
Not tomorrow, not next year, but sometime before the year 2000 A.D., this amazing event will take place. And now you will be part of it, rocketing beyond the horizon of our time to join the greatest human adventure of all time. which crashed into the Mediterranean Sea on the 11th was a single-stage, astral-propelled rocket launched 13 months ago from a site within the United States. The rocket, with its complement of 17 men, had landed on the planet Venus. Venus? The planet Venus? Some of you may also have heard the story of a monster now confined here in Rome's zoo. That beast is from Venus.
Okay, so here's the ultimate question about this. And we'll talk about the ghosts in a minute because obviously this house is haunted and that's why you should probably go and stay there because you, you may have a, you know, a run in with somebody from the, the supernatural paranormal world. But so was Lizzie, uh, was she guilty? Well, she was acquitted of all charges after her 13-day trial, after, of course, spending 10 months in jail waiting for the trial, but she was acquitted. So it's never been proven that she committed the crimes, but many people believe that she is the guilty party. And how do you feel? Or is that going to get you in trouble when you get back home? No, she did it. She did it. And that Lizzie was a looker, too. Look her up online. <laughs> Meow. Yeah. All right. So... In your house, yes. what goes on? Because we know that, uh, uh, well, people that don't know the story, Mr. Borden was murdered downstairs on the couch. Yes. Um, and Mrs. Borden mar uh, married. Yes. Miss Lizzie was never married. That's another story altogether. But her mother was murdered upstairs, right? Stepmother. Her stepmother mar murdered upstairs. Yes. So what, what happens in the house itself that now that we, is, it, is there more like interaction with ghosts or do we have more of like a replay of what events that happened in the past or no it's more interaction I, it doesn't feel to be stuck in time at all it's it's very um i see i'm not a paranormal investigator so i don't know all the big words and terminology but it's uh it's very interactive they're very conscious <laughs> and it, it's kind of like having a roommate you just never see you just keep bumping into them every once in a while they don't scare me. I've had my incidences with them. I've had things move on me in the house. I'll put something down and be somewhere else a little later on. Wow. I'll hear footsteps on the floor above me or in the next room when I know I'm alone in the house. Traditional cold spots, the unusual smells in the house. That was me. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay, I know who to blame next time. Yeah. So, so, Mr. Meaty. Yeah. So what was the first thing that you actually experienced in the house, and did that actually shock you? It is a shock the first time you actually have an experience, and it was my first week there. We bought the house in June, seven years ago, and so it's relatively still warm outside, and I had gone down to the basement and to do some laundry, and I walked off the bottom stair to head towards the laundry room, and it immediately felt like I walked into a walk-in freezer. And a couple of steps later, I walked out of that feeling, and as soon as I did, it felt like somebody ran their finger down my back. That was a little unnerving. So I just turned around, went back up the stairs, and did what any rational person would do. I called one of my employees who was in the other room and said, I need some help with the laundry. <laughs> Come down with me. And so who do you think is there? Do you think it's Mr. and Mrs. Borden that are still in the house? Definitely. Have, uh, have, they, have they communicated that to people? or? I mean, I don't know who's been in the house. I know, I know. Obviously, you know, most of the paranormal teams on television have been there. You know, yes. it's a very, a very, very popular location because obviously, with the history. I mean, the Lizzie Borden trial was kind of the OJ of its day. You know, I mean, such a huge trial and such a famous case in American history. Um, so, do they have they communicated with people? Do you get people saying, "Oh, it's Mrs. Borden" or "Oh, it's Mr. Borden"? Not directly, uh, but I interacted with them for so long now that I can sort of sense which one it is and when it is. Mr. Borden definitely has a specific feel to him, and I know he's not going to leave the house because he paid a lot of money for that house. <laughs> he's going to get every penny's worth out of it, whether he's dead or not. Uh, Mrs. Borden, I've had a couple of interactions with her, and you know, I, one specific one was, happened a couple of years ago. I was in the John Morse room, uh, the room where she was murdered. Uh, we call it the John Morse room because the night before the murders, Lizzie and Emma's Uncle John, who was the brother of Sarah Borden, Mr. Borden's first wife, had spent the night in that room. So Mrs. Borden went up to change the sheets and make up the bed, and that's where the murderer found her. Mm. Her body was found between the bed and the dresser in that room. And she was facing her murderer when he attacked. Her first blow was to the side of the face here, and then when she went forward, the killer struck her on the side of the head. So we know she saw her attack coming at her. And uh, I was in the room making up the bed and was tucking in the end sheet at the end of the bed and leaning over and all of a sudden it got very hard for me to breathe. And I pushed myself up off the end of the bed up off the end of the bed to catch my breath and as soon as I did it felt like somebody punched me in the chest. Nope. And um, my legs went out from underneath me and before I hit the floor I was sobbing. I was just crying. Mm. And my first thought was just grief, overwhelming sadness. And 
I truly believe that was Mrs. Borden. Wow. Because I don't know anybody else who would have lived in that house who would have been that depressed. I mean, she lived with her stepdaughters who hated her. Hmm. And she was a homebody. Her only social life was her family who lived two streets over. Her entire life took, took place within three blocks. And so I don't know anybody else who would have been that sad in that house. Okay. So I truly believe that was her. Wow. So after the murders occurred, what happened to Lucy? Uh, Lizzie was acquitted and uh, she moved back to the Second Street house very briefly. Her sister continued to live at the house during the trial, her older sister Emma. And after the trial and after her acquittal, uh, she and her sister started looking immediately for a new residence and they moved less than a mile away from the murder site up to French Street up in the Highlands. And she and her sister lived together until 1905 when her sister moved out, stating her sister had become unbearable to live with any longer. Okay. So we don't know if Emma actually knew the truth. Maybe she found out the truth and couldn't, couldn't deal, deal with that. that. And, and she moved to Newmarket, New Hampshire at the end of her life. That's where she lived. Thanks, Leanne, for taking the time to talk to us. You're very welcome, Dad. And why don't you guys get back to the movie here on Nightmare Theater? Animal organs, I believe. Yes, of course. My father has been experimenting in animal transplants. Very interesting. You saw this, Rob. A big man, you say. Yes, you would have to be a very big man. Big enough to... Uh... Oh, what did he steal? Nothing, as far as I can tell. I haven't had time to check everything. My father must have surprised him. Uh, I would think it was your father who was surprised. But uh, what would a, a robber be doing in a laboratory? He wouldn't have known it was a laboratory. He must have seen the light and he wanted to investigate. Perhaps. You said he was a very big man. How big would you say? I don't know. I was asleep. At least half a foot taller than you, Captain. Oh, really? That would make him more than seven feet tall. Are you sure, Dr. Marshall? Well, half a foot then. After all, he was running away when I saw him. I thought you said you saw him with the Baron earlier. Yes, but all that registered in my mind then was this hulk of a man gripping the Baron. Yeah. And then you entered a few moments after this robber killed the Baron. I tried to stop him, but he threw me aside quite easily, and I couldn't... And that was the time when you saw him run out? Yes. But you weren't hurt? No, I wasn't. How very fortunate. Well, I won't keep you any longer. I'm sure this has been quite an ordeal, Mrs. Borden. Oh. By the way, the young man... Tommy. Tommy. Where was he? He doesn't live here. He comes each morning very early. Thank you. He didn't believe us. Of course he did. He just tried to impress me. You are marvelous, Charles. Thank you. What now? Now we wait. <laughs> Nice, cheerful place you have here, Lynch. Very fashionable. It's like something out of an insane asylum. Yes, you do have the taste of a connoisseur. The taste of a man who truly knows what is obscene, vulgar, erotic, and simply grotesque. It's very clever the way everything blends together. And things seem to balance. Not one piece out of place. Not one inch of space wasted. It's truly remarkable. I am impressed. Lynch. You're such an ugly man. Mm. What's wrong, Captain? All your cells empty this morning? Oh, on the contrary. As a matter of fact, some friends of yours were kind enough to spend the night with me. I don't have any friends. Oh, but you do. There's Simon Burke and Harry Morris, and not to mention Jim Turner, and that other fellow, the little one with the hunchback. Yeah, were they drunk? Very. 
You see, they started a brawl in the tap. Saw them. You do know this. Vaguely. But what does four drunks uh, have to do with me? Hmm? You see, the fight was over which one of them was going to pay for the entire bill, which was quite substantial. Your friends drink, you know. Uh, you still haven't answered my question, Captain. Oh, haven't I? No. Well, let me put it this way. Where do four such men come upon enough money for each of them to be able to pay for himself and the other three? Maybe they earned it. Maybe. But doing what? Simon and Harry, they can't earn much. After all, how many hangings do we have? <laughs> Not enough to suit you, Captain. Lynch, you disappoint me. I don't pass sentence on anyone. I only arrest them. Uh, drinking alone? No, he wasn't. Are you in the mood, Captain? Oh, I know. Two of those men work for you, and I can't see you paying anyone enough to buy a decent dinner let alone a night's drinking for four men. All right, Captain. I wouldn't. Maybe they found other work. Something that pays the police captain's wages. I'm not laughing, Lynch. Just tell me what kind of work they do for you, since you have no legitimate business. Oh, I know you're a banker of sorts, loaning out money at exorbitant rates of interest. But you're hired help. What? They are collectors. They collect money for me. Yes. I'm sure they do. Well, I'll leave you to your whatever a man like you calls it. The same thing a man like you calls it. One day, Lynch, you're going to tell me the wrong thing at the right time. <laughs> it's useless, Tanya. You won't find the solution there. There isn't one anywhere. I have the solution, Charles. I'm only looking for a way to make it happen. Will you help me? If I can. Will you help me? I cannot commit myself until I know what you consider the solution. Another creature. Tanya, it took your father and me three years to construct the first one. Mine will take less than three weeks. Even if it took three hours, it would be too late. Then there's been another killing. Two. I didn't want to tell you. I was in town today. Everyone in the village is speaking about the monster. That is what they call your father's life's work, a monster. And they're right. They are not right. My father was a genius. And his creation will... It will do nothing but kill. You don't understand. Even without the damage to the brain, the creature has the mind of a murderer. It kills for the sake of killing. It must be destroyed. And Harris will destroy it. How can a man destroy it? No, Charles. There's only one solution. To create a second creature. You'll be creating another monster. Not a monster. An executioner. Our creature will kill my father's murderer. No, it's impossible. Even if you found the right brain, your creature, despite the superhuman strength induced by the lightning, it would need a physical body strong enough to support it. Where would you find such a man? And that's my proposition. 500 pounds if you find me the right person. Yeah, well, what makes you think I can? My father told me. It's all written in his diary. He gave you a lot of money in the three years. I don't want money from you. I see. I knew you would. Just for one night. Then I'll find you your man. It won't cost you a thing. It will. I feel nothing but repulsion for you. I don't give a damn how you feel about me. It ain't your feelings I want. Your price is too high. Then go peddle your money elsewhere. I think Captain Harris would find my father's diary very enlightening. <laughs> my selling corpses wouldn't surprise anyone. But your father buying them, now that would give everybody plenty to talk about, eh? Wouldn't it, miss? Now, think about it. No one else can help you. No one. After all, what's one night out of your life? I can't kill you. And after, you can take a bath, and everything will be brand new again. I'll kill him. 
I'll kill him. You need a drink, Charles. I don't see why you're so upset. A man like Lynch cannot be taken seriously. Still, I would kill him for even suggesting that Thank you... Thank you, Charles. I didn't know that you felt so much about my reputation. I'm sorry. Of course you do. You are a gentleman. And so you only think of me as untouchable. You're wrong. Am I? Do you ever think of touching me? Tanya, please. Does it really bother you to know that a man like Lynch desires me? No. Only that he was vulgar enough to reveal it to you. You never really believed in my father's dream. You only stayed because of me. What if I did? Then why didn't you tell me? Because you were afraid. You've always been afraid. You are afraid now. We don't need Lynch. All we need is each other. I found him. Thomas. Thomas? Yes, Thomas. Physically, he's perfect. His body's strong and beautiful. Be honest, wouldn't you like to have such a body? What does that have to do with me? Everything, because you love me. I know you do. But you've never done anything about it. Instead of your love for me giving you strength, you let it melt your spine. Stop you it. let it fester inside of you until Stop. all you could do was to look at me with those weird, Stop. hurt eyes. With the eyes of an old man. With the eyes of a cripple, a cripple who could never even dream that I could love him. Could you? Could you love me? Yes. If you look like Thomas. Then love Thomas! I can't love Thomas. He has your mind. Think of him. Think of me. Think of possessing me. Would you like to have my body bend to you? Would you like to make love to me? Yes. 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 You can. I can make it possible. My brain and my heart in Thomas's body. His heart is as gentle as yours. Thomas, with your brain, is a man I could truly love. No. I won't kill Thomas for you. I'm not a murderer. You were ready to kill Lynch. That was different. Murder is murder. Do it, Charles. I'll help you. I'll be your wife. I'll give you everything. Don't think of Thomas now. Think of him after. The way he will be.
Tom Lynch is dead. Last night. Killed by the same man who murdered your father. And Lynch wasn't robbed either. Right. It's Mrs. Marshall now. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. And this man, anyone seen him? Anyone still alive? The young man who was with Sarah Will, uh, John Masters. And this Mr. Masters, what did he see? He claims it wasn't a man. He said it was a monster. But he was too frightened to satisfy me. However, there's one more witness I would believe. Who is he? Seth Atkins' son. He saw the murderer kill his mother. But the lad's in shock. If and when I'm ever able to talk to him, I... Poor boy. Uh, sorry to bother you, uh, Mrs. Marshall. I'll see you out, Captain. Thank you. You know, I've been wondering, Mrs. Marshall, why would you visit Tom Lynch, especially at his place, and at night? The Baron owed him money, and my wife went to pay it back. Wouldn't it have been better to send for him? Really, Captain? A man like Lynch here? Of course. But then I would think Dr. Marshall should have gone, not you. It was my father's business which made it mine. Nobody else's. Quite. What I don't understand is why would your father owe Lynch money? I find your probing thoroughly impertinent. It always is. Thank you again, and good night. Oh, one thing more. You don't believe in monsters, do you? Of course not. I do. Wait till we've finished. You're worth it, Lynch, wife. Hey, Jim. Jim. Are you sure Dr. Marshall will want it? Am I sure? Sure, I'm sure. Whatever the Baron was doing with the corpses, Dr. Marshall was helping him. So it must be sure that he's still doing what they were doing. <laughs> He'll thank us good. <laughs> to hell with these facts. He'll thank us good. Money. As long as he pays, it's good. Come on, this ain't my favorite way to make a, a living. Hey, I ain't gonna... Jim, shut up. Listen. morning when I come. I see. Thank I you very to, much, Mr. Stone. Uh, clean it up. Yes, sir. I always try to keep a clean place, a clean place. That's what yes, I keep. Yes, I understand. A nice, quiet place. Thank you very much. Great That'll problems. be all. It doesn't make any sense. It's beginning to make a lot of sense. Get those shovels. <laughs> dig it up. Then dig up every one of them dated within the last two months. Just what do you expect to find, sir? Not a damn thing. Oh, no, Tommy. I wasn't laughing at you. Don't be mad at me. No, I'm not mad. Never mad at you. Well, that's very kind of you. Come here, I'll help you. Oh. There. A window. On the chair. Better. 
down, Thomas. Mm -hmm. Sit down. It's the kind of house they don't build anymore. A relic of a time when the world wasn't in such a hurry, when there was still time for a little charm and elegance. It has stood empty for a long while. And at the price, it is a bargain. For a growing young family, it is almost too good to be true. What do you think? I love it. James Brolin, Margot Kidder, Rod Steiger, in the Amityville Horror, in this house. after the Lutz family moved into their dream house. They were running for their lives. What happened to them is an experience in terror you will never forget. And you will believe in the Amityville horror. From the best-selling book that made millions believe in the unbelievable, the Amityville horror. Why would 
a man like him slaughter the woman he loved and then hang himself? Well, I don't know. Human mind. Yeah, a research project on suicide where the researcher commits suicide. Don't go inside, whoever you are. Don't go inside. Someone's in here, Bobby! Please stop! There's someone down there! Get the door open! Yeah. Away from the door. Don't worry, Bobby. I'll get you out. Why? Who's there? Who's in this house? Dr. Freudstein. No, Bob. You should have listened to what I said. Cryptozoologist. So, what does that mean exactly, Ken? Cryptozoology, uh, the literal translation is crypto meaning hidden, and zoology, of course, pertains to the study of animals. Mm -hmm. So, hidden animals is the technical description, but what most people uh, know cryptozoology as is the investigation of legendary beasts and creatures like Bigfoot, the Chupacabra, the Loch Ness Monster, and things like that. I think a lot of people know you from Monster Quest, probably, on. Uh, was that on the History Channel? Monster Quest on the History Channel. And because yeah. you do, you were on the Birdzilla episode. That was one. Uh, the, the, that was my first the, first season. And, and that was your first. Was that your first book about the, the birds or the giant flying? Yes, creatures? very good. Uh, my first book is called Big Bird: Modern Sightings of Flying Monsters, right. and it's about modern sightings of Thunderbird-like creatures. And of course, Thunderbirds are from Native American legend, and it refers to these enormous. You know, airplane-sized, eagle-like, or, or vulture-like birds that people have been reporting for you know, years and years. And of course, your most recent book is about strange creatures in Texas itself. Yes. So, apart from the bushes, what other kind of strange creatures are, are there in Texas? <laughs> well, uh, Texas, befitting of its great stature as a you know, uh, land area, actually has a lot of different types of mystery creatures. We have Bigfoot reports, we have the Chupacabra, of course, Thunderbirds, um, even really bizarre things like werewolf uh, legends and you know, lake monsters, a little bit of everything actually. Lots of tall tales. I mean, with such a populated state, there's still a lot of unexplored area there as well. This is a lot of geography in Texas, right? Well, sure. Yeah, in particular, there's one area in the southeastern part of Texas known as the Big Thicket. And it, it actually got that name from the Native American people who lived there because it was basically impassable because it was this big brushy area of vegetation. And the Big Thicket is uh, very famous for reports of Bigfoot type creatures as well as black panthers, UFOs, ghost lights, the whole deal. And so that, you know, that's just one example, but sure, Texas has other areas too that are quite mysterious. And of course, one of our favorite films here at Nightmare Theater is the 70s classic, The Legend of Boggy Creek. Oh, yes. So that film kind of showed a Bigfoot that maybe, by a lot of people's you know perception, maybe a little more aggressive than the typical mm -hmm. sort of northwestern Bigfoot, which seems shy and reclusive. You know, the most famous scene, of course, from that film is the guy on the on the toilet, the Bigfoot reaching in the window trying to oh, grab yeah. him. Yeah. So, so do you think that's Danny true? Ford. Um, well, that is supposedly based on true events. It's worth noting that the name Bigfoot, you know, obviously is. Pacific Northwest is where that name originated, up in California. And in the early 1970s, that particular moniker had not really drifted to the eastern United States yet. And that's why no one in the, the movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek, actually utters the name Bigfoot or makes that connection or link, although the descriptions are very similar. Uh, but to answer your question, we really do, in the eastern United States, have a lot, we have more accounts of these creatures or beings being aggressive towards people, attacking them and chasing them and, and so forth. You don't really hear about that much in the Pacific Northwest. And one theory to explain that is that, you know, in the Pacific Northwest you have this huge area of contiguous mountains and forests, lots of terrain and habitat for these things to roam. Whereas in the eastern United States they're kind of in little pockets. You know, things are cut off by bridges and highways and rivers. 
So the result of that could be that they just feel very territorial, you know, like we're infringing on their habitat and they feel the need to push us away. It's amazing the amount of names that different parts of the country have for creatures mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we still haven't proven they exist, but I feel like they're out there somewhere. You know, here, here in our area, here in Florida, we have the skunk ape, of course. That's correct. So, mm -hmm. Skunk ape in Florida, and you have the Momo in Missouri, and you know, the Minnesota Iceman. There are a lot of regional names for Bigfoot all over North America. Well, but, I kind of uh, think it's the same. Descriptions are very similar, yeah. Right, well, can, where can people find out more about you and more about the work that you're doing and more about stuff that you have coming up? Well, um, you can look me up on Facebook. Uh, I have a fan uh, site, Ken Gerhard, Cryptozoologist. That's probably the best place to get in touch with me right now. I post a lot of my research and photos and things on there. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. And why don't you folks get back to the movie here on Nightmare Theater. May I help you, young lady? Oh, good day. I'm, I'm looking for my brother. Your brother? He must have the Tommy. wrong... Tommy! Thomas Stack. Ah, he's not here. Have you tried at his home? I went there first. I've not seen him for a few days. Perhaps he's gone on a trip. Tommy? Where would he be? He was never out of the county. It's possible. Perhaps my father's death had something to do with it. Oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry. Yes, Thomas was very fond of him, and his death must have shocked him. Oh, yes, perhaps. I'm really sorry, but I can't help you. I'm sure Tommy will be here soon. Are you living at the inn? I shall be. Ah, oh, fine, I'll tell him. He'll be so happy to see you. Thank you, Miss... Mrs. But... Marshall. I'm so sorry to trouble you, Mrs. Marshall. Oh, no trouble. We're all very fond of your brother. I'm sure you are. Good day. again, Daddy, with the fame he was meant to have. Charles. I liked him, Tommy. I really did. Think of tonight, Charles. Only of tonight. People are talking. They're saying that Baron Frankenstein is responsible. They're saying that he created it that monster. It killed him, remember? But it didn't kill his daughter. What does she have to do with it? Well, you know how people are, Captain, especially when they're scared. Right now, they're so scared they may do anything, just anything. Something real crazy, maybe. To them, the name Frankenstein is six leagues below Satan himself. And they don't care who's wearing it. Come on, John. What's wrong? You can't change your mind now. It's too late, Tanya. I killed Thomas. You've got to make the means justify the end, for my sake. What if I fail? Charles, I... Then you fail. I'd rather give my life to you than to the hangman. Is everything clear? No question.
I do not appreciate your intrusion, Captain. I'm trying to find your father's murder, Miss, Mrs. Marshall, and I don't see how that could be an intrusion. Of course you're right. Please forgive me. I've been up all night with my husband. Then he's seriously ill. It could be. He's resting now, and after my breakfast, so will I. Have you made any progress, Captain? Not much, but the murderer has. Two more men have been killed, Jim Turner and Bill Jessup. They work for Lynch. Oh, you wouldn't know them. They're not exactly the kind you'd invite to tea. True, Julia, I've seen it. And you think that Tommy is somehow involved with this monster? Well, not in creating, but I think he found out about it by chance. And Mrs. Marshall, she's part of it too? Yes, she's lied too many times not to be. And she and Dr. Marshall, they would have to kill Tommy, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they? Maybe not. Who would believe Tommy? I would. You would too, Paul. Thank <laughs> you. 
amnesty isn't headed straight for the Frankenstein estate. Let's go, John. When I remove the stitches and your hair goes back, no one will see the difference. In the meantime, this wig will do perfectly. Now, Charlie, put your hands like this. When I release the paper, you try to catch it between your hands before it reaches the floor. But you must look into my eyes. Bravo, Charlie. <coughs> Reflex is perfect, pulse normal. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> How could I possibly know our storm would come in time? Of course you couldn't. One thing more, Charles. You see that heavy table over there? That one? Go and lift it. Go on, Charles. Young man again. Handsome, strong, intelligent, and beautiful man. Mrs. Marshall! Mrs. Marshall! What is it? Captain Harris! I insist on seeing you! You must see him, Tanya. He'll just keep on coming back. Come on. Go and see him. So welcome back to Nightmare Theater. We're here with Scott Tepperman from Ghost Hunters International. You see him on the Sci-Fi Channel. Um, we just want to get a little bit of his insight into, since he's international, like stuff that happens outside of the United States with the, the paranormal, and since we're talking about that this episode. So Scott, how many countries have you been in now? Do you know? I have no clue, but it's, it's a lot. It's been a lot of countries, a and, whole bunch. And do you think there's like a certain part of the world that has more active paranormal stuff, or is it pretty much everywhere? Um, the fact that you go to places that are steeped in history and the places are much older, you're bound to have more activity. Uh, I don't know if there's a certain particular type, like if it's a fort or if it's a jail or whatever. I don't know if that's necessarily something. I just think it depends on the actual history of the place and uh, definitely how old it is. If it's around longer, it's going to have a longer history. And do you think there are cultural differences in the way that people perceive I think that's 100% uh, accurate, yeah, I, I do. I think um, we have to understand that when we go from place to place, we can take our experiences and, and build on them and learn a little bit and keep that in the back of our mind, but we also have to approach each case as its own animal because everything is completely different. You know, despite what people are trying to sell you about ghost hunting Bibles or the way to ghost hunt, there's, there's no exact science for this. So the way that people are going about investigating it's, it, everything's trial and error, so you really have to learn from your previous experiences, build on some of them, discount some of the things that didn't work, or maybe if they didn't work, apply them differently to another place, and it might work. And are, are there certain places that you've been that really surprised you? Or, I mean, I don't want to say scared you, because I don't think people get really frightened in the paranormal field oh, very often. I get frightened. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I, frightened. I do get frightened. Yeah, I do get frightened. And, and what's, one thing that's pretty interesting is that everyone that knows me, away from the show, they said that it's very refreshing because when they watch the show, I'm the exact same person as I am in real life. Like if I say a joke, that's what I would say at home. Uh, if I'm clumsy and tripping, that's what I'm doing at home. <laughs> if I'm freaking out, I'm doing that at home as well. So that's what it is. Um, the things that do, that do surprise me are, you know, a lot of people get this into their head where if something looks haunted, it probably is. I, I don't know why that's being thrown around because I don't know if I necessarily believe that. We've gone into places that have looked lame, small, boring, new, and those are the most active that we've had. So you can't really, yeah, you can't really label anything before you go in there. You just can't. So, okay, then I will ask you, what's the, scare, the most scared you've been so far? Any time, and this has happened a few times, but any time that I'm touched or pushed, I don't like it. You like right now? Well, by something I don't see. <laughs> but yeah, well, with that mask, it's yeah. creepy. But 
but just the fact that something is strong enough and it, to, to manipulate your body, to manipulate your essence, and you don't realize what it is, there's some strength behind that, and, and it's, it's personal. And you take that as, you, you almost feel like it's a home invasion or something. Okay. And it's a very weird feeling. I, I had a Mel Meter out, uh, it was Puerto Rico, Joe and I were investigating the theater. Something threw the Mel Meter out of my hand. I do not know what the hell it was. It freaked me out. And that's just one of the instances. I've had numerous accounts like that. And is there, are there places that you can sense that it may not be a very friendly spirit that's there with you? Or have, have you had that experience? Or Yes and no. Um, I've never really personally dealt like face to face with a demonic force. Uh, we've had cases that involve demonic possession, but I haven't personally come face to face with something. The thing that I do believe though is when, when some, something dies, whatever, uh, whatever the way they were in life is what they're going to carry on in death. So if they were a nice person in life, they're going to be nice in death. If they were nasty and confrontational and antagonistic, they're going to be the same way when they die. So sometimes it, it certainly is very um, necessary to provoke because you're, you're dealing with something that's standing, you know, you don't see it, but it's standing, it's like, please, talk, talk. You want to get a rise out of it. You want to kind of evoke some kind of a response. So it just it just depends what you what you start getting a feel with what you're dealing with, then you have to tailor your questioning to that and tailor your investigation to it. Okay, we'll just change gears on you. What's your favorite paranormal horror film? My favorite movie of all time is The Exorcist. Um, but I personally think to this day, and I'm the horror buff. I'm the horror buff. I like diehard horror film. I know everything about horror. Movies. But Poltergeist is the best uh, haunted house film to this day. The only one that came close to me. A lot of people disagree with me, but Insidious. I think it was outstanding. I think how it was normal and it started slowly unraveling, it was great. And I think Paranormal Activity was actually probably one of the worst, as well as the second one, it got worse. I don't understand how it could have got worse but the first, but it did. See, he's a very smart man, because I totally agree with him about that. Um, just to tell you, Scott, we showed, we showed Poltergeist at the theater on Friday night. We had a crowd of about 75 people. 30 of them were teenage girls for some reason. And when they clowned, they yeah, couldn't see you. Who wouldn't put that mask? And when the clown popped up in the bed, the whole theater went insane, yeah. screaming. It, it's still a very effective film. To be honest, some of my favorite movies are the Saw franchise. I love that franchise. Because it was a well-written, smart movie, you know, from beginning to end. It respected its audience. I like that. It didn't go to get crazy and try to change the formula if it worked. I'm, I'm all for repetition. Entertainment through repetition. If it works, do it again, do it again, do it again. That's fine. Who we know all about that? Exactly. Exactly. But, I mean, there, there's certain movies out there. And yeah, that's that's a huge example. Exorcist is my personal favorite movie because um, that's just a, uh, uh, an exercise in phenomenal filmmaking from beginning to end. Script writing, acting, storyline, pacing, editing, everything. Music, sound, everything. Cool. Okay, and then one last question for you because obviously you're here on Nightmare Theater. What's your favorite? I like so many horror movies. One of my favorite all-time movies that, that seems to be on everyone's list of crappy movies is Chopping Mall. And, and Chopping if I honestly made a list of my top ten, well, I have a top ten of my, a list of my favorite movies of all time, non-horror and horror, Chopping Mall is, is proudly up there. Cool. Directed by the great Jim Bonorski. Phenomenal movie. We love, we love Jim. So. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us, Anytime, Scott. guys. We appreciate it, and uh, happy hunting out there. Good, thank you. I hope I can leave now. You're both creeping me out. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys get back to the movie. <laughs> I must see Dr. Martin. Captain, if you feel extremely ill, I cannot see you. I'm not asking your permission. Oh, Reese, Mrs. Harris, this is a... Yes, it is, Mrs. Well, I shall report you to your superior. You do that. Please leave my home. Not until I see your husband. Reese, you have no right, Captain Harris. That's far enough, Captain. I'm sorry, Captain, but my illness is quite contagious. You shouldn't risk coming any closer. I want to speak to you alone. Whatever you have to say, I want my wife to hear it. Very well. I came to warn you about the monster that you and Baron Frankenstein created. I hold you responsible in the deaths of eight people, including the Baron. Of course, you can prove it. If I could, I would be here to arrest you. I know that you are my proof. I want you alive, Doctor. Why should anyone want to kill my husband? Not anyone. Only the monster he helped to create. Of those killed, four were responsible for giving it life. You, Doctor, are the fifth and last. That's absurd, Captain. How could Lynch and those other two... By providing your father and your husband with corpses. I don't have to tell you how they were used. How else are we to know what you are talking about? 
Those jars in the laboratory, it won't be difficult to prove they contain human organs, not animals. No, Doctor. You never considered the creature might not appreciate your man. That's why he killed the Baron, three other men. That's why he must kill you. Why didn't he kill Charles when he killed my father? Because your husband wasn't in the laboratory at the time. This is the most extraordinary fable I've ever heard. You really disappoint me, Captain. A robber killed the Baron. As for those other two pyramids of integrity, anyone could have had sufficient reason to kill them. Perhaps it's your incompetence that's led your imagination awry. I suggest you take a Very well. Day. I've warned you. Remember, lies can't keep you alive, Doctor. But I can. Your concern is a great comfort to me. Good night, Captain. I don't know what you've done with Thomas, but I'll find out. And when I... We must get away tonight, Charles. No, Tanya. Darling, Harris and his men will find the monster. They'll destroy it. They don't know how. I do. Every available man. I want this place surrounded. And make sure the men tell no one, especially their wives. Now hurry. Yes, sir. Because you know that no matter which of us survives, you still win? You do know. You've always no. known.
me. I belong to you. Yes, Thomas. My love. enjoyed the film here in our, in our visit to the Pensacola Paracon when El Sapo said he had some one we could take back to our room and I didn't know this is what he had in mind. Right, but uh, gonna have a good time. Anyway, um, I hope you had a good time. I hope you did enjoy our, our guests tonight. They were fascinating and, uh, and the movie and well, you know we'll be back next month with another movie. You know how this ends. Um, until then, may all your dreams be nightmares. Did these are guys really? This is what you did once. These are the ones. That, this one's mine. That one's yours. Okay. Uh, at least they're beef eaters. Take it back to the movie now? Yeah. <laughs> There's your stinger.